Hey, good morning, everybody. Man, I'm excited to be here with you this morning. Very excited to be here. Hey, I want you guys to think about something, just to, just to challenge you. For the majority of, of our lifetime, of our my lifetime and your lifetime, the church has been, in our country, the home team, right? Amen. Now, when you... Uh, when you go, let's say, watch a Blazers game, how many of you were at a Blazers game lately, right? When the home team is announced, people are pumped up, right? They're cheering you on. They always get way more into it. Woo! They announce the home team, and then they announce the away team. And the announcer always kind of gets a low voice, and now for the Denver Nuggets, number five, and no one really cares. Every once in a while, they might get some courtesy claps. But most of the time during the game, people root against the away team, Right? When they shoot free throws, they always have those, you know, I don't even know what those things are called. I'm not even going to try to make a name for them. You know what I'm talking about. And they're trying to make them miss. For the, the majority of our life, in our country, the church has been the home team, but now times are changing. Yeah, that's right. The church is becoming the away team. And the question I've had to ask myself, I've had a couple weeks to reflect and really be in prayer and listening to God, is how will we respond as a church in the place where we are the away team? when people are rooting against us and we are treated as, as such. And the question I've asked myself is, when we think of Liberty Christian Church, this body of believers, what will our, our legacy be? Typically, when we think about church and moving forward, we think oftentimes too small. As Pastor C said last week, we put boundaries, right, on what God will do in our lives and for our church. And typically, we only think about five to ten years out I want to encourage you and challenge you to think generationally. When people think of Liberty Christian Church, what will they, they think? Will it be for and about God's glory or our glory? And what will we have to pass off to the next generation? Our children and our grandchildren and our nieces and nephews, what will they receive when they take leadership in the church? And think about what we have received, right? The church right now is in a very interesting place in our country, a very challenging place. I came across an article by Thomas Rainier saying that, and this was a recent article in 2018, but I've seen statistics all the way back to 2014. Back then, it was about 4,000 churches were closing every single year. It has ramped up to about six to 10,000 churches in the U.S. are dying every single year. That means 100 to 200 churches will die this week. This is what we have received. This is what we have inherited, right? I want to challenge you. What would it look like to pass off a thriving church to your grandchildren Amen. someday? Amen. Where we will see articles coming out, not with six to 10,000 churches are closing every single year, but how many thousands of churches are growing every Amen. single year. Amen. All the people coming to know Jesus every single year. And reflecting on our situation we're at as a church across our country, it reminded me of Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17, and we're going to kind of jump around through the entire book of 1 Corinthians, because it's very similar to kind of where the church is at in America right now. We have come, become a little bit divided, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 through 17. It's also going to be on the screen. You can use your smartphones or your iPads, or if you have it memorized, that's fantastic too. Paul says... I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus. Man, that's a great name. Man, when my son, if, my, if we're going to have another boy, Crispus, Diana, you, you cool for that? She says no. What about, what about Gaius? Is that equal? Never mind. For, she said yes to that. No, I'm just kidding. For now, no one can say they were baptized in my name. 
but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. Verse 17, for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news and not with clever speech for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. So what's going on in this chapter in the church of Corinth is the church was losing their foundation. They were arguing about silly things that don't matter. They were divided. And we see it's all in the news headlines and giant bold letter. We are a divided country. Do you think the church is divided as well? Yeah, unfortunately. Absolutely. Unfortunately, yeah. Denominations. Some people say we do it this way. We do it this way. And I'm not saying this is the case for every single church, but the majority. And at times people view it as, as a competition. And sometimes it breaks my heart. I receive these, these uh, catalogs, and they just have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books written by hundreds of different pastors. And I think this is kind of what Paul's talking about as we get to the point where, oh, I follow this pastor, and I follow this pastor, and I follow this pastor, instead of saying, I follow Jesus. Amen. And Paul is encouraging the church to get back to what matters. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ and the one who was crucified. Amen. That's all he brought. Paul says, that's all you need. I came to you in weakness timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching was very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches that relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit, I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Can I get an amen from the church? Amen. Paul says, I came in, in weakness. My sermons weren't that good. I just simply brought you the message of Jesus. I, I relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. My message was very plain. I wasn't, wasn't fancy. It wasn't having the best service, the most professional photo with nicely uh, cheeks without reflections. You know what I'm talking about? The best sounding music, the, the most polished announcements, ushers that pass the offering without being awkward and staring at you. We don't do that here, but you know what I'm talking about. Paul says, I just simply brought you the message of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, Paul says, Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation of an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. So the question I've asked myself is, was the church in America built on something other than Jesus? Maybe it started right, but Paul says, again, to be careful, because I think losing the foundation of Jesus Christ is, is easy. And I think when we reflect and we see that six to 10,000 churches are closing every single year, you think that we have lost it. We have lost the foundation, and we have become divided, just like the church in Corinth. So what is the most important thing Paul wants the church in Corinth to remember? What is, what is the message? We've talked about it. We've seen it a little bit in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. And in chapters 4 through 14 is really instruction and kind of how to fix what they're doing wrong and answering their questions. But it culminates in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. is I believe, the pinnacle of the book of 1 Corinthians. And Paul is saying, if you want to get on track, start right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. Paul says this, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue, if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. And when we think of Approximately 3,500, this is another article I read, 3,500 people are walking away from the church every single week. This is people who traditionally have gone to church and then all of a sudden they just walk away. If you truly believe in Jesus, do you just walk away from him? No. Maybe there's something that they believed in that was never true in the first place. And now comes the most important verse in verse 3. We're going to read the first half and reflect a little bit. Paul says, I passed on to you, church, what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. 
what is the most important thing? As we think of the future of Liberty Christian Church, what is the most important thing that we might do things wrong, but what if we could do one thing right, what is the thing we should do right? For the rest of this chapter, Paul is going to talk about the most important message that he wants them to remember, that he passed down to them and wants them to pass down to the next generation, that we want to pass off to the next generation. And this is simply this in the second half of chapter, uh, verse 3. So Paul says, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Here it is. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. Amen? Amen. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Paul is saying, if you can just do one thing right, make it be Jesus' death and resurrection. Let this be the most important thing, the foundation of the church. Another translation saying the most important is, means the first in rank. If you just do one thing right... Let it be Jesus' death and resurrection. And Paul says, if you don't believe me, as he continues on, listen to this. Jesus, his death and resurrection was seen by Peter and the 12 disciples. And then he was seen by more than 500, most of whom are still alive. Paul says, don't believe me, then ask them. He was seen by James. And last of all, Paul says, I have seen him, even though I'm not worthy. In verses 9 through 11, Paul says, for I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am not, it is all because God poured out his special, special favor on me and not without results. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you've already believed if your foundation is Jesus' is death and resurrection. And when Paul says in verse 10, It's because God poured out his special favor on me. I covet God's special blessing for Liberty Christian Church. Amen. Yes, amen. And God pours out his blessing on those who trust him, those who walk in humility, those who truly believe and live out Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul says it doesn't matter even who preaches it, but it needs to be preached. It has the same impact if I do it than if you do it. So church, I will ask you the question again, what do we want to be known for? 100 years from now, when people think of Liberty Christian Church, what will they think and will this church body still exist? Because right now, six to 10,000 churches are closing every single year. And there's approximately 250,000 churches in our country, so you do the math. If this rate continues, if it accelerates, the amount of churches in America will be cut in half in like 10 years. And when I was reflecting on this, my first thought, and it's kind of the shock factor, right? My first thought is, oh my goodness, this is so awful. But I want to turn that around because the reality is maybe this could be a good thing for the gospel. Because out of the trial as the church in our country, we will learn and grow into something much greater than before. And we will see the day where there are not thousands of churches closing, but thousands of churches opening for God's glory. And we can't have the mentality that I get, uh, I can get caught up in as well as we just want to get back and where it was back in the good old days when people actually went to church, back in the 50s when everyone went to church. Listen, do we believe the best days for the church are ahead of us? That there's such a a hope for the gospel in our country, and there is this seismic shift, seismic shift happening in the church, and I guarantee that through it, God will be glorified because he's in control of the whole thing, right? And through the embers of a dying church, new flames will come. And Jesus' death and resurrection will be the foundation of it all. But we have lost our way as a church in our country. But we're beginning to find it again. We're beginning to reset our foundation. Paul says in this book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is the greatest It's the most important thing of all. But what is love? People ask, no, you can't define love. I beg to differ. It says in Scripture, John chapter 15, 12 through 13, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has none than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And 1 John 3, 16 says, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us. 
and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So we think, what is, what is love? Jesus' death and resurrection, His life, His sacrifice, that is what love is. It is Jesus. It is His sacrifice. Amen. And this is the foundation of our faith. This is the foundation of what we do. And here's the deal. If Jesus did not sacrifice His life and raise from death all that we are doing, all that we are investing into, and all this work that we've done this last year, it's all completely worthless. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a couple verses after with the passage we read, and if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. What I'm doing right now is useless, and the faith that you have is useless. And Paul is so confident in his belief, he said, if Christ did not raise from death, then all you do, all we're doing as a church is worthless. Your love is worthless if Christ was not raised from the dead. Does that mean if we are not centered on Jesus Christ and His death and resurrection, all of what we do is useless? If Jesus isn't the foundation of all that we do moving forward as a church, is that useless? Is that why thousands of people are walking away from the church every single week? Is that why six to 10,000 churches are closing every single year? But they may teach of Jesus, but Jesus is not at the helm. There's something in front of Jesus. And you see, we should never, as followers of Jesus, move forward from the gospel. We don't learn about it in Sunday school. Then we grow up and say, oh, that's, I learned about that in the fifth grade. I've moved on. I gain more knowledge now. No, you never move forward from the gospel because the gospel is everything. And when you lose the foundation of the gospel, that's what you'll see will happen in culture, a massive church decline. And this should challenge us as a church because if we ever stray away from Jesus and His death and resurrection, then all that we do will be useless. There will be no baptisms. There will be no revival. There will be only death. And we will be remembered for nothing. And here's the deals I've been reflecting on. A lot of the times we put responsibility on other things. It's the culture's fault. It's the government's fault. What if it was our fault? What if we were the ones that lost the foundation of Jesus? And it's time for us and myself together as a church to take responsibility because we are the ones that got us here. This is our fault. And as we move forward, that's why we're going through this sermon series the beginning of this year for the next couple of months. It's called, It Starts With Me. The gospel being made known in our community, it starts right here with me. Why not a Liberty Church? Why not this small church in in, in South Salem? And looking at past revivals and culture and changes, it always starts in a place like this. When a small body decides that, that we want to be different and we want to be known for our love and not for our hate, We want to be known for the gospel, the good news. We want to be a place of hope. We want to be a place that's founded on Jesus' death and resurrection. And when I'm talking about the church, I'm not talking about this building, right? right. right. God has blessed us with this facility, but I'm going to tell you, He doesn't care about what color the paint is. He doesn't care about how many walls are in the building. When I'm talking about the church, I'm talking about you. I'm I'm talking about me. I'm talking about this body of believers. It says in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 24, He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since He is Lord of heaven and earth, He doesn't live in man-made temples. So where does He live? In us. us. He lives in me. He lives in His followers. And so in our culture as a church, we need to turn our heads to consumerism because we did not come to church to consume, but to be co-laborers in the gospel. We work together. I can't do this by myself. We do this together and reflect as a church, what will our legacy be? 
What will we be remembered for? What I pray is when people think of Liberty Christian Church, they will think that that group, they're a little bit odd, <laughs> but they're, they're passionate about Jesus. Amen. They didn't get everything right. They definitely were not perfect, but they sure loved Jesus and they told people about him. And I found hope at Liberty Christian Church. When our children and our grandchildren and our nieces and, and nephews in 50 years, when they reflect on this time at Liberty, what will they think of? What will our legacy be? And I pray we'll be Jesus. And I pray that when the next generation takes a hold of the church, there will not be a church decline, but a church incline. Amen. Of thousands of churches opening. As a reflective, not just thinking five or ten years, thinking generationally, what will we pass off to the next generation? Because we will not live forever. We will be as Paul. He says, I passed on to you what was most important and was also what has also been passed on to me. This all starts right here. In you and in, and in me. It starts right now. It starts with me. It starts with with you. You want revival? And I believe we all want revival in this country. Amen? Yeah. You want revival in this city? You want people to be baptized in the name of Jesus? It all starts right here. Amen. You want to reach people? You want to see people give their life to Jesus? It starts on our knees in prayer. Amen. It starts by walking in faith, even though it may be scary that we come together as co-laborers in the gospel, we lock arms together and we march forward into the dark abyss for God's glory. Amen? Amen. And the foundation of everything that we do will always be on Jesus. And we'll check ourselves before we wreck ourselves because it's easy to lose that foundation, as Paul says. It's easy to let your pride get in the place of Jesus. It's easy to let power get into the place of Jesus. But it starts right here, and here's the plan. As I said, in February, we're launching back into two services, and by God's grace, we're going to outgrow this facility. And God has been gracious to us this last year. Don't think he's going to slow down. He's going to speed up. This is what happens. The snowball gets rolling. Word of mouth gets going. People hear about what God is doing, and it happens in Scripture. When Jesus heals people, people show up. God works, God changes lives, people will show up. So February, we're going to do our hardest, we're going to work hard. As Paul says, we work hard for God. We're going to outgrow this facility by God's grace. And I want us to come together as a church in the future and say, we don't know where to go. We don't have any more space because there's so many people coming to Jesus. We're going to have an outreach service this Easter by God's grace in the community. We're giving back to our community we're going to grow our small group communities by God's grace and again lock arms together and move forward for the glory and honor of God. This all starts right here. Again, you think this last year we saw the hand of God. You think God's going to take a break. Just wait. Just wait. The greatest is still to come. Amen. There's a great and mighty hope in this country for the church and for the gospel, all for his glory and honor. And it all starts within you. Amen. It all starts within me. When we say we're going to be different and we're going to have a foundation set on Jesus' death and his resurrection, and that's it. Amen. We're going to come in humility and weakness, at times timid and trembling for God's glory and honor. And we're going to shout. And we're going to shout for Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to pray, and our team's going to come forward, and we're going to reflect on Jesus' death and resurrection. And I pray, again, as we said before, that the church, and we talk about the church, we're talking about us, our foundation will always be on Jesus' death and resurrection. And as we see a seismic shift happening in our country what I think God is doing is he's resetting the foundation. Because God's church will succeed in the end. We know that is true. The bride of Christ Amen. will not fail. Amen. And what if we get to be a part of that ride? Oh, hallelujah. What if God uses you and uses me? And he yeah. will, I believe it. That's not saying that the, the journey is easy. God never says this life will be easy. Growing in church is difficult, right? That's why Paul's writing to all of these churches. But he says, if you do one thing right, let it be Jesus. 
and never lose that foundation. Let's, let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much for what you've done in this church body this last year. And as we come to you as the church, this body of believers, we say that Jesus will always be the foundation of this place. And we pray that you'll use us as you used Paul. We, we pray your special blessing will be upon this church and your gospel will move forward by heaps and bounds for your glory, God. This isn't about me. This is about you. I pray when people walk through the doors of this building, when they walk into our lives, what they will witness and see is Jesus. Even if we come timid and trembling in weakness, I pray the Holy Spirit will work through us and what people will see is Jesus. Amen. I pray as we move forward as a church that these two services will outgrow this facility, that there will become a time in the near future when we say, where do we go? What do we do? There are so many people coming to know Jesus that we'll be see countless people be baptized for your glory and honor, that there will be revival in this country, in this city, and it all starts right here, Amen. right now starts with me. We thank you, Jesus. Let us honor you as we take communion together as a church. Let it always be the foundation of what we do. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen.